Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. And uh, hereafter, I shall speak in English. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Great pleasure to be here in Brussels and to be speaking on this subject and to meet some old friends. Uh, my name is Ben Sessa. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I'm a, the head of psychedelic medicine and the co-founder of Awaken Life Sciences, a biotech company specializing in the research, research delivery and development of psychedelic drugs for medical treatments. I am a trained and approved MDMA, ketamine, and psilocybin psychotherapist. And in relation to the one of the things Carl said about coming out of the closet, as a senior doctor who works with professionals and with the government, I can tell you on the record, I have taken intravenous LSD, intravenous psilocybin, intravenous ketamine, intravenous DMT, and oral MDMA. I've taken all of those compounds in legal settings um, as part of research trials that we've been doing in the UK. So I don't think there's that many doctors in the world who would be willing to stand on a stage and say that, um, but it was all done uh, legally. Now, I may or may not have had other experiences, but I don't need to mention those. So um, I'm going to talk about addictions. The formation of addictions, why it's so difficult to treat addictions, why addictions are so prevalent, why our current treatments are so bad, um, and why psychedelics fit really well into the treatment of addictions. And I'm going to focus mostly on 3,4-methylindoxy-methamphetamine, MDMA, um, and highlight some work of a study that we've done recently in Bristol in the UK. So first thing to say is that addictions are massive. This is not a small public health problem. This is a huge prevalent problem all over the world, um, affecting millions of people and costing millions, billions of US dollars annually. They're very hard to treat, so this is a major problem. We're not talking about some rare disease here. We're talking about a major public health problem. So in the UK, before COVID, about 24% of the UK population were drinking more than 14 units of alcohol a week. Uh, which is the cutoff for alcohol use disorder, it's estimated that post-COVID, around 45% of adults are now drinking more than 14 units a week. In other words, approximately half the population of the UK now would satisfy the diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. These are not people in services, but they're all walking around with AUD. That's huge, and we're sitting on an epidemic that's waiting to happen. Now, psychedelics have a very rich history in the treatment of addictions. Indeed, the very earliest work with psychedelics in the 1950s and early 60s, the majority of the work was for addictions. Um, there was a famous group in Canada, uh, Humphrey Osmond and uh, Hoffa, who, who did most of their work using LSD psychotherapy for alcohol use disorder. Um, it was actually Humphrey Osmond that coined the term psychedelic. Um, and here, they started using LSD because there is a, there's an aspect of uh, acute alcohol withdrawal called the delirium tremens, DTs. It's an intense physiological reaction in which a patient has massive metabolic disturbance, um, seizures, a coma, and death in about 15% of cases. It also involves an organic psychosis. So Osmond and Hoffer found this little bottle of liquid coming out of a Swiss laboratory called Sandoz LSD25 says on the bottle, induces an organic psychosis, but perfectly safely. So they said, well, why don't we use this to induce this perfectly safe organic psychosis and see if that works? And the reason they did that, because when people have delirium tremens, acute withdrawal from alcohol, it's been well known about 5 to 10% of people who experience the DTs, if they don't die, they have this spontaneous sobriety, no desire to return to alcohol. So, he's, so Osmond said, well, here we've, here we've got this new compound coming out of this, from this chap called Albert Hoffman, and it says induces an organic psychosis, but safely without the physical effects. So they gave it to their alcoholic patients, and indeed they had 90% treatment positive results using LSD psychotherapy. And this work was going on really well in the late 50s into the early 60s in Canada. Um, there was actually a large meta-analysis of the work done in the 50s, 60s, and 70s from the Canadian group, um, done a few years ago by uh, uh, Krebs and Johansson, who found a very strong effect size. So historical roots of treating addictions with psychedelics are very strong. Um, 
Michael Bogenschutz there, he uh, repeated this, uh, this experiment in more recent years using psilocybin therapy to treat addiction and again found very, very positive results for treatment of AUD. And what uh, Bogenschutz found was that the patients that had the biggest mind-blowing mystical type experience had the best rates of recovery. Um, uh, my colleague Matthew Johnson, who's on the board at Awaken Life Sciences where I work, uh, he's carried out a psilocybin therapy treatment for nicotine addiction, again another massive public health problem with very, very poor outcomes, and he found fantastic results with psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. And like Osmond and like Bogenschutz, they found the patients that had the biggest mind-blowing mystical experience had the better rates of recovery. Um, and then we have Ev uh, Evgeny Kropitsky um, working at the Pavlov Institute in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, I would always want to visit the Pavlov Institute just to ring the bell and see what happens. Um, he found high-dose ketamine, um, very, very effective. Massive study, over 1,000 patients in the Russian Federation treated in the 1990s with ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And again, the patients that had the biggest mind-blowing mystical spiritual experience had the higher rates of sobriety. And then coming right up to the modern day, uh, uh, Celia Morgan, uh, person at the bottom there, she's also on our scientific board at Awaken Life Sciences. She's uh, carried out the world's first evidence-based uh, ketamine-assisted psychedelic therapy, RCT, um, for AUD, for alcohol use disorder, and has found tremendous results that blow out of the water the current best treatments for alcoholism. So the history of addictions and psychedelics are very, very well bound up together. Um, I want to turn to 3,4-methylindioxymethamphetamine. Now, in order to understand MDMA, and how we use it clinically, you need to go right back to developmental pathology. Uh, as a child psychiatrist, I'm always very keen on discussing childhood issues, childhood development, attachment, and those early years. And it's essential to have this kind of understanding if you're going to carry out MDMA psychotherapy. Now, when we think about child attachment and child abuse, we often think about the big things, physical abuse, sexual abuse, the sort of stuff that hits the social services radar. But I always say, don't take your eye off the ball when it comes to emotional abuse and neglect. Those aspects of child abuse are profoundly damaging to the developing child. I don't love you. Your dad doesn't love you either. You're stupid. You're fat. That picture you just drew for me, that's rubbish. Anyone could have done that. No one will like you. You'll never have a boyfriend. You'll never have a girlfriend. Why did we even have a child? Now, no one's being hit, no one's being sexually abused, but that kind of drip, drip, drip emotional abuse has a profound effect on the development of psyche. And it's all about this concept of attachment, because the patterns of de the developmental patterns that are formed in this early attachment become the blueprint for our adult functioning. How we function as adults, what is love, what is trust, is it okay to cheat? Is it okay to lie? Is it okay to steal? Is it okay to drop litter? We learn these things when we're that high, and we never really lose them, no matter how much we try. It becomes very rigid. Now, through a secure attachment where you're loved and you're cared for and you're played with and you're praised, you develop this narrative about yourself, that you're a good person and you're worthy, and you develop a narrative about the world, that it's a safe place full of lovely, friendly, charitable people who will help you and you can trust. If you're unlucky enough to have an insecure attachment in the, these early pre-verbal years, you believe you are a useless, worthless person. You can't achieve and you're, not, you're just not worth being here. And you believe the world is a dangerous place full of people who can't be trusted. If someone tells you that they love you, they're lying. Get the boot in first before they hurt you. Now, this is such an overwhelm, overwhelmingly awful position to be in that for so many people, the best option is just to blunt the edges. Sedate themselves with dangerous substances such as heroin, crack cocaine, and far, far, far more dangerous substances such as alcohol. Now, we know that, and uh, both the other speakers touched on this, that the development of mental health disorders is far, far more 
than just genetics. It's far, far more than just parenting. It's far, far more than just abuse. It's a multiple of factors that contribute to the development of, of adult mental health problems and particularly addictions. And the patients that we work with in psychiatry are on the bottom rung of the ladder. We work with the people who are homeless, people who have transgenerational poor education, poverty, racism, exclusion, unemployment, and all of these risk factors stack up on top of one another. So most of the patients that come through our doors with mental health problems such as addictions have all of these factors. They've come from the poor homes with the poor education and the poor genetics and the poor parenting and they happen to be using drugs, which as Carl quite rightly pointed out, it, therefore, it's not the drug that is the problem. It's not, it's those social factors. I could have a pint of beer, I could have two pints of beer, I could have a line of cocaine, I could have a spliff, I could have an ecstasy tablet. But because I have a nice, happy home and kids and family and a partner and a job that I like to do, I'm gonna stop all that activity on Sunday night because I got stuff to do on Monday morning, which I like, and it makes me feel secure. Now, if I'm sitting there at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning with a pint of beer in front of my hand, there's something wrong with my life. Now, we can't blame that pint of beer. That's the same pint of beer I had on the Friday night, but for some reason, it, I can't have it on the Monday night. It's not the beer. It's not the cannabis. It's not the cocaine. It's not the heroin. It's the pattern of dosing of those drugs. And when we ban the drug, we're not seeing the wood for the trees. We're blaming the drug when the problems are psychosocial. Indeed, I believe the importance of this attachment relationship is so strong, we could empty half of the prisons and half of the psychiatric hospitals today by having better care for single mothers with children under five. If we had that kind of social intervention, we would drastically cut offending and mental disorder everywhere. That is how strong the attachment relationship is. Now, I'm not a big fan of categorical diagnoses. I think the DSM and ICD are necessary books, but um, mental disorder is gonna be mental disorder. If you hurt a child, you will have a broken adult. Now, they may, get a, they may get PTSD, they may get an addiction, they may get an eating disorder, they may get anxiety, they may get depression, they may get a personality disorder, it doesn't really matter, they are all irrelevant. The cause, the underlying thing that's going on here is this trauma that underlies them all. It's a bit like, let's, since I uh, talk about psychedelics, a mycelial bed um, lying under the ground, and the fruiting bodies that pop up, the mushrooms, are the diagnoses. The mycelial bed is the trauma, and up pop these little mushrooms under this, grown from this bed. And the mushrooms are anxiety, depression, PTSD, addictions. Now, if we focus on that mushroom, we're missing out what's going on underneath, and this is the problem. Now, how does MDMA work? Now, a lot of people think MDMA is just increases serotonin. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced than what that. Um, it works across multiple systems and multiple different types of serotonin receptors. So at the 5-HT1A and 1B receptor, this is where we have this reduction of fear, reduction of depression, reduction of anxiety. Um, and that's a very positive effect. It's a very, very positive effect to have a reduction in fear. This is perhaps what might pe pe people would con consider the euphoric or ecstasy effect of MDMA. And that's a good thing. Um, there's also action at the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the receptor where the classic psychedelics like LSD, uh, psilocybin, DMT, mescaline work, and, uh, but not to the same extent of those classic receptor effects. Um, so we don't have total dis ego dissolution. We don't have dripping walls and melting faces with MDMA. But we do get enough of a thinking outside the box, the ability to have some uh, original thinking, to tackle old problems with new eyes. We've then got this uh, unusual paradoxical um, part of MDMA going on, in which the amphetamine part of the molecule provides a sense of stimulation, 
This increases the level of arousal. This motivates the patient to take part in the therapy. But at the same time, paradoxically, via the alpha-1 and 2 receptors, we have a relaxing effect. We have an effect uh, which takes the edge off that hypervigilance that comes from recall of painful trauma memories. And at the hypothalamus, we have a hormonal effect, the release of oxytocin. Now, as you all know, oxytocin is the hormone secreted from the brains of breastfeeding mothers. Oxytocin engenders a sense of positivity and engagement, bonding, and attachment. So MDMA is the perfect drug for psychotherapy. If we were to invent a drug for trauma-focused psychotherapy, with all the factors we wanted, we'd come up with MDMA. It's short-acting, about four to six hours. It doesn't have the perceptual disturbance of classical psychedelics, but it does have this thinking outside the box ability. It's almost always pleasurable. That's a very important factor in de developing a clinically deliverable drug. Uh, there are few, uh, few drugs in psychopharmacology that are so invariably pleasurable, opiates being another. I often say to my medical students when I'm teaching them, if you don't like heroin, you don't have a brain. You need to go and see a neurologist. There's something seriously wrong with your nervous system if you don't have a positive experience on heroin. Now, I'm not saying that to suggest they should go out and take heroin. Um, but MDMA is like that. Pretty much everyone likes it. Um, the classic psychedelics can go either way for many people. Pretty much everyone likes the experience, and that's good when you're trying to de design a deliverable drug. But the main reasons why it's so effective is because it provides us access to the painful traumatic memories that underpin uh, adult disorders, particularly addictions, as a result of trauma. Now, it does this by selectively inhibiting the fear response whilst leaving the other faculties intact. That's very, very important. Now, many drugs will inhibit the fear response. A bag of heroin will inhibit the fear response. A bottle of vodka will inhibit the fear response. But those are messy drugs. You can't work on those drugs. You can't do psychotherapy on those drugs. But um, MDMA has this unique pharmacological um, effect of switching off the amygdala. So just the fear has gone, but you can still talk and debate and remember and uh, have psychotherapy. And crucially, you will remember it the next day. Um, and that makes it extremely important in therapy. Now, a little bit of a physiology lesson for you here. Um, so the brain is often think, thought of as three different regions. This region here, the, this lump at the top of the spinal cord, uh, is called the brain stem. Really, really basic. Uh, it, it, it does blood chemistry, blood temperature, heart rate, breathing. Um, it's really, from an evolutionary point of view, it's really basic. Cockroaches have one of those. If we go up the evolutionary ladder a little bit more, we get to what we call the midbrain here bit more sophisticated, sometimes called the mammalian brain. Dogs, cats, giraffes, us, we all have an, a mammalian brain. And it contains this area, this red area, the amygdala, which fires in response to a fearful environment. Um, it's what we call a bottom-up response. No top-down cognitive um, input is required. Um, somebody comes running into the room with a knife. Now your amygdala will fire, and it'll tell you, get out, you're in danger triggers a hormonal reaction called fight, flight, freeze. No thought required. Now, if we go a little bit further up the evolutionary chain to this area here, the prefrontal cortex, this is our lofty human brain, where we have judgment and reasoning and logic. And these two areas are in constant debate with one another. Person comes into the room with a knife. Your amygdala fires. You're in danger. A fraction of a second later, frontal cortex kicks in and says, well, he looks OK. He looks like a happy kind of guy. He's wearing a chef's hat. He's probably the chef. I reckon I can reason with him. So you're in constant debate. Now, if you subject a child to constant fear throughout their childhood, they never know when they're going to be kicked, punched, burned, raped. They develop an excessive amygdala response. They find things more frightening than other people and they have an attenuated, shrunken prefrontal response. They're not very good at self-soothing and talking themselves out of pain. So you go into adulthood with this excessive, painful, terrified response. MDMA reverses that. It shuts off the amygdala, and it boosts the prefrontal response. And this was studies done um, by my colleague uh, Robin at Imperial. It does the exact opposite of that traumatized brain. 
So we decided to set up the world's first addictions study with MDMA. Now, up until this point, every single MDMA study had been done on PTSD, run by a group called MAPS. Um, ours was the first non-MAPS-sponsored study in the world. And we chose alcohol use disorder. I was working in addictions at the time. We chose AUD because it's a very, very common, massive public health uh, problem with huge rates of poor outcomes. Uh, it was an eight-week course of therapy where the patients took two sessions of MDMA alongside non-drug sessions for preparation and integration. We had 14 patients. We, re we recruited alcoholics from detox groups who were uh, waiting to go into alcohol detox. Um, and we had a male-female co-therapist pair. Um, that's roughly what the uh, protocol looked like. Uh, screening, pre-detox, consent and eligibility. They then went into the 10-day detox, so they came out of that dry um, on zero alcohol. Then they came into this eight-week course in which they take MDMA twice, um, sandwiched between preparation and integration sessions. That's a very typical protocol for, uh, MDMA, for any psychedelic protocol has this mixture of drug and non-drug sessions. We then followed them up at three, six, and nine months to collect data. Now, I've been talking about MDMA for over 15 years, and I used to show pictures of graphs and ravers and ecstasy users and neurocognitive deficits. I just don't bother. I'm just going to leave you with the statement, MDMA is very, 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 very safe. And there is lots and lots of data for that. In the UK, we have 750,000 doses of ecstasy taken every weekend. Three quarters of a million doses of ecstasy every weekend for the last 30 years. Yet the rates of mor morbidity and mortality are staggeringly low. We may be talking five deaths a year. And when those deaths are looked into, as, as Carl um, went, went into, and you do proper toxicology, they almost always involve concomitant drug use, alcohol, opiates. So I'm not for a second saying that MDMA is 100% safe. Nothing is 100% safe. Cars, parachuting, sharks, love, dangerous stuff. But it is very, very safe. And we know that from the massive epidemiology of its use. And the other thing, clinical MDMA is not recreational ecstasy. You know, comparing or conflating kids in clubs, drinking, smoking uh, ca cannabis, taking alcohol, using cocaine, staying up all night, not sleeping, not eating, and then being ill or possibly dying, you can't compare that to somebody lying in a bed in a clinical setting with a doctor and a nurse and a psychologist monitoring them. So clinical MDMA is not a recreational ecstasy, but even recreational ecstasy is staggeringly safe. Nevertheless, in their wisdom, the Ethics Committee wished us to meticulously look at the physiology of our patients. And these are the pooled results across 26 sessions. As you can see, uh, you get a transient slight rise in blood pressure, temperature, and heart rate, which then comes back down. Uh, the green line at the top is the drug effects. Um, this is over eight hours of the day. Um, and all of these are within normal levels, so we saw no abnormal physiological reactions. Um, I love this table because it is absolutely staggeringly boring, um, which is exactly what you want for a safety and tolerability study. We had no deaths, we had no suicides, everybody tolerated the drug well, all of their bloods were normal before and after, all their ECGs were normal before and after. Um, uh, they all gave an, a qualitative report that they found it useful compared to other previous treatments. So that's a good outcome. Um, now, one thing people often ask me, but what about come downs? What about MDMA come downs? Well, first, first of all, do you mean ecstasy come downs or do you mean MDMA <laughs> come downs? Now, we wrote a paper that's, that's had quite a lot of criticism um, called Debunking the Myth of Blue Mondays. Uh, we wrote that, that came out last year, and there's been a lot of debate around that. Blue Mondays, this concept that a few days after MDMA, you have this low mood, this affect drop. It's a well-known phenomenon. I am not for a second suggesting that ravers do not get Blue Mondays, or Yellow Tuesdays, or Suicide Wednesdays, or whatever they call it. It's a well-recognized phenomenon in the raver community. All, as is the acute come down as the drug wears off. But what we found across 26 MDMA sessions, not a single come down, 
and their affect remained high, indeed elevated, with an afterglow effect for a week afterwards. So this again tells us something about the difference between MDMA clinically and ecstasy recreationally. And think about it, how do you take ecstasy? You go to the pub, you have a couple of pints, you go around someone's house, you drop a pill, you go to the club, you have another pint, four o'clock in the morning, you have another pill, snort a line of cocaine, you go back to someone's house, you have another pill, you do a bit of amphetamine, you smoke endless spliffs, you get no sleep, you stay up all night. Sunday night, if you're lucky, you'll have a little cup of soup and get two hours sleep. You go into work on Monday, and then you say, oh man, it's, it's MDMA serotonin depletion. <laughs> it's a bloody hangover. <laughs> You've been large in it all weekend. Imagine taking ecstasy or clinical MDMA where you come to the clinic after a good night's sleep, you take the medicine at 9.30 in the morning with no other drugs, perfect water balance, no exercise, you're lying on a bed in the dark, you're up and you're down by 5 p.m., you've been working really hard with your therapist, you have something to eat, you sleep like a baby and you feel great for a week. So I'm not saying that the hypothesis of serotonin depletion isn't a potential, it's never been properly prospectively tested, but certainly we cannot conflate recreational ecstasy use with clinical MDMA. What were our outcomes? So it took us a very long time to get 99.98% pure GMP MDMA. They had to recrystallize the precursor six times. They lost yield and we ended up from a kilo of precursor with only 190 grams of MDMA. So we thought, while this is going on, we did an observational study. Because we couldn't do a randomized control study with two arms of the same cohort, we, did, we looked at how, how patients having uh, detoxes in Bristol were doing. And the results were sad. So they all came in with very heavy daily use of alcohol. They all dropped down to zero after their detox. And with no intervention from us, but with complete intervention from the very best that modern medicine gives alcoholics, MAP groups, AA, anti-craving drugs, inpatient rehabs, lots and lots of money, lots of time. By the end of nine months, pretty much all had returned to where they'd started. Very typical result, very, very sad. This is the best modern medicine does for the alcoholic. We were better at treating alcoholism in the Victorian times than we are today. That's how it is. And that was the result after our MDMA study. Uh, it was, a ma it was a, as closely matched group of people as we could get it using the same questionnaires and the same entry criteria, but they had the eight-week course of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Um, I superimposed those two graphs. I've changed the axes slightly to say over 14 units. In other words, they all have AUD, so it's 100%. The red line are the ones that got the traditional treatment treatment as usual, and the black line are the ones that got our MDMA study. Now, 75 versus 21, that is a staggering, staggering result. That blows out of the water the current best treatments for alcohol use disorder. Now, let me be clear, this is not two arms of the same randomized group. These are two separate studies. We're comparing a treatment as usual group with those that got the MDMA which means the obvious next step is to go to a phase 2b study um, with a placebo group, so we can decide whether it is the MDMA or just the wonderful therapists, um, and then go on to phase 3. This is a study that's underway at the moment by Awaken Life Sciences, and with a plan to take MDMA for AUD into FDA and EMA for approval and license use of treating alcohol use disorder in the next few years. Um, Awaken Life Sciences is a biotech company. We don't just do research, we are also training psychedelic therapists, um, and we're opening clinics, and that's a really important part of what we're doing, opening clinics uh, all around the world. This gives us the opportunity to be the high street presence for where people come to get psychedelic therapies. Um, MAPS are not building clinics, Compass are not building clinics, loads of ATI are not building clinics, loads of people are doing work within the psychedelic sector, but we're the only people who's, visit, um, apart from a group in the States called Field Trips, we're the only people who are building physical bricks and mortar clinics. We have three so far, Bristol, London, and Oslo. We intend to have 15 to 20 in the next few years where people will come to get their therapy. And you can see our research plans around addictions. We're taking the MDMA study forward there. We're taking Celia's ketamine study forward into phase three, where we currently have underway uh, behavioral addiction studies, um, and we're also making new chemical entities 
um, new, new molecules with intactogenic effects like MDMA, but we're aiming for them to be shorter acting, two hours, which makes them more clinically deliverable. Um, now, we are not just a ketamine infusion clinic. You've probably heard about ketamine infusion clinics. There's six or 700 of them in the States. Ketamine was serendipitously discovered to be a rapid-acting antidepressant about 10, 15 years ago. And there's all these clinics that you go in, you get your shot of ketamine, you go home. No psychotherapy. I've heard of some of them. They even say, oh, I'm really sorry. You're going to feel a bit weird for a couple of hours. Don't worry. It'll pass, and you can go home. Now, that feel a bit weird for a couple of hours, we like. We think that's important. Because we're trained MDMA and psilocybin therapists, we use ketamine as an adjunct to psychedelic psychotherapy. It's not an irritating side effect, that weirdness. It's a valuable mental state that we can work in. So we, we can only use ketamine in our clinics at the moment because it's the only licensed psychedelic medicine. MDMA, psilocybin, D LSD, DMT, they're not medicines, they're research chemicals. They are moving towards becoming licensed medicines, and we will have them in our clinics ASAP. So think of it as Awaken Psychedelic Medical Clinic, ketamine now, MDMA and psilocybin coming soon. And we use them for a whole, we use ketamine-assisted psychotherapy for a whole range of different treatments, not just treatment-resistant depression, which the ketamine clinics do, but also anxiety disorder, PTSD, eating disorders, and all addictions. Um, do come and have a look at our clinics. They're very, very beautiful. Uh, Bristol is a lovely city. It's the San Francisco of the UK. Um, and uh, we have lovely staff there, and we're having great results so far. We also have clinics in London and Oslo. So just going to fly through these before I end, because these are some of the questions that come up in using psychedelics to treat addictions. You're just swapping one dangerous drug for another. Well, that's an absurd thing to say. There is nothing you can do that's more dangerous than drink a bottle of vodka a day. There's no medical inter intervention out there that's worse than a bottle of vodka a day. So if taking MDMA or psilocybin or ketamine on one, two, or three occasions stops you drinking that bottle of vodka a day, that's an excellent cost. Um, uh, benefit over cost. So that's rubbish. The risk of addiction is psychedelics. Psychedelics are not on the radar in addiction services. Trust me, I've been in addiction services for over 15 years. Never seen a case of MDMA addiction, psilocybin addiction. Nobody breaks into your car to steal your objects to get their next magic mushroom fix. It's just not on the radar. And we know this from animal studies. Lack of research of proven, lack of research of proven efficacy, that's rubbish. Every single one of the, of the pilot studies with psychedelics for clinical conditions in every condition, from depression to anxiety to PTSD to addictions of the last 15 years, have been tremendous results. Not just okay, tremendous, like ours. Now, they're small pilot studies and they need to be repeated, but so far the, 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 the level of efficacy of psychedelic therapies is huge and deserves further work. The only ones that didn't work were the microdosing uh, studies recently. Uh, I'm not a big fan of microdosing, and if someone wants to ask me a question about that later, I'll tell you why. Um, sends the wrong message read drug policy. I mean, we are, pff, don't even have to say that. The, the message read drug policy should be the truth. Um, drug policy is ineffective, unpleasable, unethical, dangerous, kills young people. Successive home secretaries have blood on their hands for the deaths of young people who would not die if it were not for the prohibition. Um, so that I'm not even going to go there because Carl and other speakers have done that. Costly and difficult, yes. Really, really expensive. Pharma industry are not interested in this. Pharma industry are not interested in drugs that you only have to take once, twice, or three times and be better. These are not maintenance daily drugs that you have to take weeks, months, decades to mask symptoms. These are drugs that are more like surgery than our current top-down biological paradigm of psychiatry, where you stay as a lifelong patient being cared for in a palliative care type fashion. Because if you present in your early 20s with PTSD or addictions, it's due to ch childhood trauma, there's a pretty good chance you'll be talking to your psychiatrist in your 60s or 70s. Now, after 100 years of psychiatry, that is not good enough. Psychiatry is failing these patients with, these, with this top-down biological model, using symptoms to mask, using daily medicines to mask symptoms. This is more like having an orthopedic surgical operation. An intensive, upfront piece of work gets you better, gets you out the door forever. Stigmatizing, 
Absolutely. If there's one thing I will absolutely credit the war on drugs for brilliantly, it has poisoned the minds of intelligent and erudite people for the last 50 years. Even smart people who should know better, senior doctors, they hear the words LSD, and their, and their first thought is, <gasps> makes you jump out of windows. It's like, God, have you not read any papers for the last 50 years? Um, it's been a very, very effective campaign of telling lies and not listening to sciences. So we do have barriers. Um, I've been involved in over 15 years of psychedelic research. It's been a tremendous pleasure. One thing we massively need to do is increase diversity and inclusion. There's far too many old, white, bald, middle-aged men. Um, that's something that's not just in psychedelics, it's across the world, but we have to fight with, in my opinion, positive dis discrimination to move that forward. Um, so the take-home message makes sense from a clinical point of view, from a social point of view, and from an economical point of view to fund and develop effective treatments for addictions with psychedelic-assisted therapies, and especially MDMA. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Merci pour cette invitation à changer de point de vue sur le MDMA. Euh, il reste un peu de temps pour quelques questions, une ou deux questions. Est-ce que certains d'entre vous souhaiteraient... Oui, là-bas. Ah. ah, ici. Euh, oui, excusez-moi. Bien, merci. Ici, Carl, right here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for a really nice talk. And uh, I, I really like your uh, take home message. Um, I have a question related to some of the things you said. Just, uh, I just am concerned that you might be working against yourself. Uh, for example, your radical acceptance of what's happening in the brain. <laughs> I, I think that's a bit too optimistic. Um, just like when we um, develop most of the treatments for depression or the theory, the monoamine theory of mood. Um, we knew about six neurotransmitters, and even now we, we know a hundred or so. The theory hasn't been really appreciably updated. And then so your sort of narrow reductionistic way of thinking about that, that's a bit overly optimistic given what we don't know that's happening there. And I, I only make that point because you'll find other drugs that will do the same thing that MDMA does at the neurochemical level, but doesn't have the therapeutic benefits that you're, you so nicely laid out. So uh, that, that's, that's one, one sort can, of- can I, can I come, up on, come back please, on that? Please, yeah. please. So yeah, I am a clinician. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, so forgive Forgive the mistakes in the neuroscience. Um, it is a dumbed-down version. I knew you'd be here, Carl, so I wanted to make it easy. Um, <laughs> so, I, yeah, I absolutely accept that uh, I don't know enough about the neurobiology at the higher level, and also, you're quite right, that it changes all the time. But what I would say about the neurobiology of MDMA, and similarly, the neurobiology of ketamine and psilocybin, all of which have different uh, neurobiological mechanisms, Ketamine works by releasing BDNF, and this results in dendritic growth, which results in this neuroflexibility. Psilocybin interrupts the default mode network, which uh, results in a change in connectivity. Those are three very different mechanisms, but from a psychotherapy point of view, what they all do is they open a window of opportunity, which allows the psychotherapist to work on the stuckness that's there. So I'm probably getting the neuroscience wrong, absolutely, and thank you for that. No, I, I, but but I the point about the psychology is it's the opening of the window of opportunity, and that's where we then hit them with the psychotherapy I, to tackle the rigidity. I, I, it, it, it wasn't really that much of a criticism as you took. Uh, what I'm saying is that just be careful because you're working against uh, the good sort of clinical work that you're doing by stating that, because there will be 
uh, that we will find out that certain drugs will have a similar mechanism of MDMA, but doesn't produce the clinical benefit. Yeah. So that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and finally, with the addiction, uh, like your animal models, you, you're, you're saying that psychedelics uh, uh, are not associated with addiction. It's just that we haven't really been looking for addiction with animal models with psychedelics. Uh, a drug like MDMA, uh, anything that people like and take, you run the risk of potentially, potentially having it be overused. Uh, and then when we think about animals, uh, animals won't take nicotine. It's really hard to get them to take nicotine, but humans take nicotine. Mm. Animals won't take THC. Uh, and so these animal models for, uh, for addiction uh, probably not the best models to be referring to. And, yeah. and, and, and just because it's potentially, it has an addiction potential, doesn't mean that it shouldn't be used therapeutically. So just yeah. no, I, I agree with that. And any of us who know about animal models and addiction will have heard of the whole rat park scenario and how for 50 years we've got it wrong in our statement of animal addictions. Um, it, it, it's actually psychosocial things. I guess my main take on the low addiction um, for, for psychedelics, as I said, comes from the epidemiology of use um, and my, my work as, a, as an addictions consultant um, in 10, 12 years in addiction service, just queues around the block for alcohol, benzos, uh, uh, crack cocaine, and heroin, and nobody ever coming into our service with MDMA psilocybin. So I prefer that kind of real-world approach that you just don't see. You just don't see that kind of drug-taking behavior for addictions. But thank you for both those points, Carl. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask the question you wanted to hear. Um, it's over here. Yes. Um, it's a question about uh, the mind-blowing experiences. Um, you said that most effects of, of, of the treatment are, are with uh, high doses, uh, with mind-blowing experiences. Um, but as you know, and you stated, uh, microdosing is kind of a thing. Um, and I hear you're not very enthusiastic about it. Uh, I just wanted to, to know your view on microdosing um, in treatment of anxiety disorder or, or depression or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Okay, so microdosing is very much the flavor of the month and has been for a couple of decades now, starting out on the west coast of California and now all over the world. Let me get this straight. If you are a microdoser, it works, okay? You do microdosing, you will report it works. Great, that's fab. I love to hear people saying, this works for me. I no longer have to take this codeine. I no longer have to take this sleeping tablet, I feel better at work, I'm more creative, my relationships have improved ever since I started microdosing. Great, microdosing works. However, the recent data of two studies have suggested, yes, it does work um, at a gross level for the individual, but it strongly looks as if it is a placebo effect. It's not an active drug effect. If you want it to work and you believe it works, it works. So yes, it does work, as does crystal healing and horoscopes and other vague fictional things like religion. They all work if you want them to. So great, do it and enjoy it. It's a hell of a lot safer than taking SSRIs. So do it. If you, you like microdosing, it works. But the recent evidence suggests that once you have a good blinded study, it's not about the drug. Whether the patients were on the drug or not, they still felt it worked. And when they didn't think they were on the drug, they didn't think it worked. And there has been two studies that have shown that. That's my main problem about microdosing, the science. My second problem with microdosing is so many people are not microdosing. They are threshold dosing. They're taking threshold psychedelic drugs day after day after day. The amount of people that come up to me at events like this and go, oh, hey, Dr. Ben, I'm on a wicked microdose buzz today. It's like, if you're on a microdose buzz, you are not on a microdose. Today you are threshold dosing, and you threshold dosed yesterday, and you're going to threshold dose tomorrow. And I've seen a lot of clinical patients start to unravel. Psychedelic drugs are superb, but they ought not be taken every day at a threshold dose you do start to lose the plot. Um, and this, there's, there's more and more evidence of this coming through. So if, if you are microdosing, make sure you are microdosing. The way to do it is to increase very, very, very slowly. The moment you get an effect, drop down to at least one or two places below where you've got no effect. That's your sweet spot. If you're on a buzz, you're not microdosing. And the third reason I don't like microdosing is because 
why I like psychedelics. I'm in the psychedelics game because I don't like daily maintenance medications. If you're going to take a drug every single day, sure, LSD, psilocybin are much, much safer drugs than SSRIs, but it, my, my whole principle is I want to get people off taking drugs every day. I'm much more keen to, for you to come in and take a high-dose psychedelic, a proper high-dose psychedelic with psychotherapy, get better, and then not have to take any drugs every day, either SSRIs or psychedelics. So those are the three reasons why I'm not a big fan of it. But if it works for you, knock yourself out. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Ben Sessa.